Okay, so welcome uh, everyone. So this uh, is a presentation for the theory group within uh, the X Research Week. Um, well, to start with uh, uh, maybe it's worth a reminder that uh, um, Queen Mary tradition is a long tradition for research on logical methods for reasoning about computer systems. So this tradition uh, really can be traced back uh, to computer science pioneers like Peter Landing, who was a professor at Queen Mary, and uh, Peter Landing influence is still uh, very alive in, in many computer languages we use today. For example, even Python, indentation in Python uh, comes from Peter Landing, among other things. Um, so I, I would say trying to describe uh, in a paragraph what uh, the theory group uh, ultimate goal is, one could say that uh, what we try to do is to understand, uh, mathematically understand the principle underlying computing and information processes. And uh, from this understanding develop uh, principled methodologies and algorithms uh, for, uh, uh, for such systems. So we don't really look uh, primarily to the latest technology or the latest application, we try to get to the most fundamental principles. Um, over the years, theoretical work from uh, our group has paraded the several develop developments. Uh, here are a few, separation logic, information theory for security, game semantics for programming languages, optimization and game theory for cybersecurity, process types for web services, logic for computing, continuous systems. So um, maybe the most uh, famous among uh, all these uh, developments is a separation logic, which is quite a remarkable story. So separation logic was, uh, is a logic developed uh, uh, in the theory group X by Peter O'Hearn, and it really started as a theoretical investigation in uh, substructural logic. So it was uh, an investigation on variation of linear logic and uh, um, structural rules for such logics. But in fact, ended up, uh, uh, it was found to be relevant for reasoning about uh, um, heap memory, uh, computer memories, in particular the heap, and uh, ended up underpinning software analysis tools that are used daily by Facebook and uh, impacting billions of users worldwide. In fact, uh, I mean, all the uh, mobile software from Facebook uh, before being deployed goes through this uh, uh, analysis software tools uh, for um, uh, bug detection. So that's a remarkable story, but uh, as uh, a theory group, uh, so there have been uh, fundamental contributions over the years uh, to pure logic, so model theory, proof theory, categorical semantics, but also in um, information theory and uh, uh, complexity theory. Um, so we will uh, see some of these aspects in the talks uh, uh, today. Uh, from uh, a practical point of view, so maybe it's worth mentioning the uh, funding also that the theory group has received. So over the years we've been awarded uh, about 8 million pounds in research funding. Uh, such funding has been supporting a thriving intellectual community. Among this uh, uh, funding, uh, uh, to note there are a platform grant, a PSRC platform grant. This is a significant amount of uh, money awarded to leading research groups in the UK to underpin their strategic development. Uh, also, we've been um, awarded uh, two EPSRC program grants, and these again are uh, major funding, uh, and the format is a flexible mechanism for providing funding to address significant major research challenges in research programs of up to six years. On top of this, we have been um, awarded uh, several uh, EPSRC grants uh, in responsive modes, and um, most of our uh, uh, team, uh, in fact, uh, have been um, research fellows uh, of, 
of uh, some prestigious institutions. So some have been uh, ECR, so European um, Research Fellows, EPSRC Advanced Fellows, uh, Royal Society Fellows, and uh, Royal Academy of Engineering uh, Fellows. Today, uh, the um, talks uh, will be as follows. So the first talk will be by uh, Paolo Oliva on a quantitative analysis for the borel cantel lemma. I will uh, then uh, give uh, a short overview of some research um, on information security and cyber security at, uh, in our group. Artur Amerigo will talk uh, about quantum quantitative information flow. And Yung Xiao Zhang will talk about the game theory for cybersecurity. And Andrew Liu Smith will uh, give a talk on constructive fuzzy logics. And uh, finally, uh, Edmund, uh, Edmund Robinson, head of uh, group, will uh, talk about the logical relations and process equivalence. Uh, so there are uh, there is time for um, questions and answers. So. Uh, you can also, there is um, a chat box with question and answer, so you can use that uh, uh, during the talk and then uh, the speakers can address uh, your questions. Um, so that's uh, um, from me to start with. And uh, uh, at this point, I uh, would give uh, so the floor to Paolo for uh, talk uh, for his talk. Yeah, Paolo, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see the slide? Yes. Sorry, this <laughs> okay, so my research has been mainly about studying the connection between proofs in mathematics and computer programs. So mathematical proofs are normally used as a way of showing that something is true. So you, you want to know if a conjecture is true or not, you try to find a proof. And if you find a proof, then you have turned the conjecture into a theorem. Computer science or computer program, on the other hand, are about doing something, calculating, computing. And there is, but there is this interesting connection between mathematical proofs and computer programs in the sense that quite often, mathematical proofs do give you a construction as well. So in, in, in order to prove that something is true, a mathematician will normally give, you, give us a construction. And my research has been mainly on trying to unveil these constructions from mathematics as algorithms and computer programs. I think this short talk will be just one, um, I would say, very simple example of this. Which, is, which has to do with this, this interesting and amusing theorem called the infinite monkey theorem. So the infinite monkey theorem is the, a well-known result that says if a monkey is hitting keys at random on a typewriter for an infinite amount of time, then it will almost surely type any given text. So if you just let the monkey keep typing keys at random, then eventually, with probability one, the monkey will type in the complete works of William Shakespeare, let's say. So that is an interesting result. And maybe I have to get out of the way here so you can see the, the proof. So the proof is quite simple. So it says that, okay, let's take AI to be the event that in the text that the, the monkey has typed, we, look, we divide that text into blocks of the length of the text that we are looking. So let's say we are looking for Romeo and Juliet. So we look at the length of Romeo and Juliet, could be, I don't know, one, 10,000 characters, let's say. And then you divide the, the sequence of keys that the monkey is typing into blocks of 10,000. And AI is the probability that the Romeo and Juliet appears in the i-th block. Of course, that event has non-zero probability because there is a chance that the monkey will type that. And therefore, if you look at the compound probability, so if you add up the probabilities over an infinite amount of blocks, this will diverge because each PAI has a non-zero probability and it's a constant non-zero probability. So as this compounds, this goes to infinity. 
And then the second Borel Cantelli lemma says that if this sum diverges, then the AIs happen with probability one infinitely often. Okay, so by AI happening infinitely often, we just mean the event of, uh, so you're talking about the probability space with, with some outcomes and some um, probability function. So that's the setting here. And given a sequence of events, AI, we say that AI happens infinitely often is simply describing the event or the set of outcomes which happen infinitely often in AI, okay? So you could think of this as the intersection over all i's of the union of all j's bigger than i, so of aj. So AI happens infinitely often is actually an event. So you can talk about the probability of AI happening infinitely often being either zero or one. And then, and in that theorem, we are using the second borel cantel lemma, which says that if you have events that are mutually independent and the compounding sum of the probability diverges, then the probability that AI happens infinitely often is one. And that's what we were using in the infinite monkey theorem. So this is a zero one law because the first borel cantel lemma says that the, the kind of converse also holds. So if the, if the sum converges, if the sum is bounded, then the probability of AI happening infinitely often is zero. Okay, so the, the probability of AI happening infinitely often is either zero or one, depending on whether the sum of the probabilities converges or diverges. That's for mutually independent events. If the events are, are, are not mutually independent, then this of course doesn't hold. Now, these are class, these classical results are qualitative in general. So they don't say anything about how long we need to wait until we, we have a chance to see um, maybe even the first word in the, in the Romeo and Juliet, let's say. So what we are doing here is looking at quantitative versions. So for instance, we would like to say, if you want to be, let's say 50% sure that you are gonna see the, the, the book Romeo and Juliet being typed, how long do we need to wait? So to be 50% sure, then we don't need to wait an infinite amount of time. There is a finite amount of time that guarantees that with 50% probability, we are gonna see the text. And by that, I just mean, if you have you know, a, a huge number of, of monkeys typing on the keyboard, then half of those monkeys by that time will have typed the, um, the, the text of Romeo and Juliet, let's say. So that's, that's the kind of result we are looking at. So we look, we are going for the, from the qualitative version, which is the one above here, to the quantitative version. So instead of saying, if this converges, then the probability of AI infinitely often is zero, we are saying, if we have a rate of convergence, if we know how fast the sum of the probabilities converges, so if we have this rate of convergence that we call phi, then we also know how, how close this sum, this probability of the union gets to zero. Okay, so we are trying to be quantitative and we do the same for the second borel cantel lemma. It's just the, 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 again, the other way around. So if you have a rate of divergence for the sum, then we also know how close, how, how long we need to wait until we are one minus epsilon, so epsilon close to one. So instead of just saying that eventually the probability is one, we are saying that's how much you have to wait to be close to one by some, some error. And that's it. So we, we have been looking at quantitative versions of, of these borel cantel lemmas. Also, there are Erdos Renier generalizations and Koch and Stone theorem is also an odd generalization. And in our recent paper, we looked at quantitative versions of all of those results, which give us algorithms, ways of numerically computing and finding out when things happen. So I think that's it. So I don't want to take more too much because I know there is a long list of speakers. Any questions? I don't know if we are taking questions or saving that for later. So you are muted, Pascal. Thank you very much, Paolo. That's yeah? uh, okay. very nice. Uh, yeah, if, if we can have uh, uh, questions now, questions at the end. So uh, if there are no urgent uh, questions, this work. 
uh, we can uh, move on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so then uh, I'll... Uh, I will uh, now just give uh, um, a uh, short talk. So now this is, um, <clears throat> can you see the slides? Yeah, we can see them. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, a some extent also the preparation for the next two talks. So um, it's a little short report about two themes of research within the theory group. So the first theme is information theory and quantitative information flow. And the second uh, is game theory and optimization for uh, uh, cybersecurity. Um, and there are two strand of research, I've been a bit involved with other people here in the group. So about the first one, information theory, quantitative information flow. So what is information theory? That's a major uh, mathematical discipline, which is really at the basis of the digital world. So is um, is it say that there would be no digital world without information theory? So information theory was uh, created by Shannon. It's based on the concept of entropy, which is a mathematical measure of uncertainty. And uh, more precisely, information theory is the mathematics of storage and transmission of information. So you can see there why um, it's important for uh, computer systems. Several years ago, together with colleagues, uh, Sebastian Ant and uh, David Clark, we, de we developed something called the quantitative information flow, QIF, which is an application of information theory to information security. So the idea here was to quantify leaks of confidential information or privacy in uh, computer systems. Um, there are a few recent advances on QIF uh, from here, from our group. The first is on channel design. So the channel design problem uh, is the problem how to design privacy mechanisms which are optimal in the sense of leaking as little private information as possible while respecting the utility constraints. So we've been working with this, uh, uh, with Arman, uh, Arman Cusani and uh, Arthur Amerigo. Uh, and you can see, I mean, this kind of uh, research uh, would have application, for example, in geolocation privacy. So, so you, if you use geolocation privacy on your mobile, you want to uh, say where you are, more or less, because otherwise it would be useless. But at the same time, maybe sometimes you don't want to say precisely where you are for privacy reason. Uh, some more recent work, again, uh, uh, joint work with Armand Cusani and Arturo Amerigo, which is very exciting, is an axiomatic work, is a very theoretical work, where we developed a set of axioms for uh, information theory. So we've gone beyond uh, security, but uh, this uh, work uh, concerned the whole information theory community. And in this work, uh, this axiom characterized the largest class of functions, mathematical functions, satisfying good information theoretical properties. So the fundamental properties that uh, one would attribute to entropies. And these are data processing inequality, conditional reduced entropy, uh, fun inequality, and uh, Shannon perfect secrecy theorem. So we have uh, found kind of the largest class of function where these uh, properties uh, holds, and uh, we have present this uh, class of functions on, uh, in an axiomatic form. Uh, and uh, a third strand of research, and uh, here I, uh, Arthur will talk uh, about this, is about quantum quantitative information flow. So this is a joint work with uh, Arthur Amerigo. Uh, so here we have uh, applied uh, quantitative information flow for quantum systems. The second thread of research is uh, a game theory on TV detection for cybersecurity. So the aim here is quite different and has also a very practical uh, relevance, if you think. So what we want to do is uh, help people or organization to make better security decisions in cyberspace. And uh, 
so to address these kind of things, mathematically, we use game theory, and in particular, Stalkerberg games, optimization, so mixed integer linear programming, strong duality linear programming, to provide a mathematical framework and uh, efficient algorithm tools for these decision support problems. And all this is um, a long-term project uh, uh, that uh, uh, joint works uh, with uh, Armand Kuzani, Jung Shao Zhang, who we talk today, Fabricius Beraldi, also from Leaks, uh, Ethan Liu, and uh, Chris Ankin from Imperial College, and Manos Panusis, nowadays at uh, University of Greenwich. And in fact, I mean, for this research, we have uh, an online tool uh, available uh, at uh, uh, on a server. Actually, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, see this if you are uh, interested that's the website and so you can play with this optimization you can design the security scenario you can run the optimization uh, you can have the Pareto front basically you can see what would be the optimal decision for this kind of context um and okay so uh i stop here so i say this was a bit of also present preparation for um, uh, arthur uh, and Jung Chao talks so Arthur, uh, do you want to give the talk or should I run the video, yeah? Yeah, uh, I think the video might be better okay. just because it's a yeah. bit noisy here as well. So. Okay, so uh, I will then uh, uh, present uh, Arthur's presentation. Uh, okay, again, should... Uh, We share the screen. Good morning, everyone. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, I. Uh, okay. My name is Arthur Américo. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Queen Mary, and I'm going to present a work that I did with my advisor, Pasquale Malacaria. So first, some introduction and objectives. The field of quantitative information flow, which uh, we call simply by KIF, is concerned with quantifying information leakage on systems. In this work, we present a, a generalization of key, the QIF framework for quantum settings. This generalization is based on a very popular framework in KIF literature, the G vulnerability framework, and also on the field of quantum statistical decision theory. So first I'll give some preliminaries on KIF. The classical setting of KIF is the following. There is a secret input X that usually is a random variable, usually a discrete random variable, and is fed to a system K. There is an adversary that does not know the value of X, but which wishes to obtain some information about it. And this adversary has some probability, sorry, some knowledge P of X, which is a probability distribution or over the possible values of the secret. The system then produces an output, y, according to some conditional probability, p of y given x, that is an intrinsic property of the system. The adversary seeing this, uh, this output updates his knowledge to the conditional probability p of x given y. So how do we measure leakage in this setting? We usually use the G vulnerability framework that was introduced by Alvin et al. And it, it works in the following way. An attacker can be modeled by a game function G, which correspond to his interests and capabilities. So there might be different models of attackers, attackers that are different, in, uh, sorry, that are interested in different things. And a suitable G can model, for example, one try attacks. So the attacker can only has one chance at guessing the secret. 
not as adversaries that are only interested in part of the secret, and also brute force attacks, and much more. It's a very versatile framework. The prior G vulnerability of the secret is the expected gain of the adversary before the execution of the system. And the posterior, of course, is the expected uh, G vulnerability after observing the output. Leakage then is just the difference of the latter quantity, the posterior G vulnerability, and the prior. So now how do we generalize the setting to a quantum setting? Well, we we'll still have a classical random variable as a secret. So we still assume the secret to be some classical quantity. However, we have a quantum system, which instead of uh, just giving a classical output, will leak some quantum state ho of x. So the system can be seen as just a map from the possible values of the secret to quantum states. The adversary does not know the state ho of x. So to obtain some information, he chooses a measurement ae and applies to ho of x. The measurement gives some physical outcome y, which is a, uh, is a common set in quantum uh, physics. And as before, the adversary updates his belief. Now, there is some intrinsic connection here with the classical system in that each choice of experiment by the adversary gives rise to some classical system K of E in the sense that the quantum system and a choice of experiment behave as a classical system. In this way, we can define then the posterior quantum G vulnerability as the one given by the optimum choice of measurement between some available measurement to the adversary. This setting is similar to the one used in the field of quantum statistical decision theory. And that means that some of the results of that field are applicable to QQF, including a quantum version of the Black or Sherman Stein theorem, the BSS theorem, which was proved by Buscemi. I mean, of course, the quantum version was proved by Buscemi. In classical KIF, the BSS theorem is of utmost importance, is because it provides a necessary and sufficient condition for a system to be always safer than another. That is, for, that is, for all Gs, for all game functions, for all attack scenarios, all interests of our adversaries, and so on. And under some constraints, Borchemi's quantum generalization plays a similar role for QQIF. So in this work, we propose a frame framework that generalizes KIF to a quantum setting using the G-vulnerability framework that's very popular in the literature. This is also based on quantum statistical decision theory for which we have some interesting results for KIF. And future works include applying this framework to analyzing leakage in quantum systems and generalizing important, important classical KIF results to this quantum setting. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, thank you, Arthur, for uh... The excellent uh, talk. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, you can uh, ask questions uh, now. There is also a text box, or uh, we can um, have a, a QA session uh, at the end uh, of all talks. Um, okay, so. Um, then uh, we we'll say we can move uh, on now. And uh, uh, Yung Shao, Yung Shao, are you ready to give a, a talk? Yeah. yeah okay. Just Thank you. Thanks. How to? Uh, can you say my yes. screen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, good morning, guys. My name is Yung Shao. I'm a postdoc research assistant of Professor Pasquale in Serial Group. Today, I'm going to talk about some recent 
work on game theory for cybersecurity. First, let us look at the security games. A security game is a two-player game between a defender and the attacker. The attacker decides how to reach his target, while the defender selects a security strategy to mitigate attacks. Many recent works like to use a stackable game to mold interactions between the defender and the attacker. A stackable game is a sequential game. The defender will move first, then attacker observes defender's move and moves accordingly. There are some successful applications of security games like Armour and Iris security systems. They have been developed, they have been deployed in LA International Airport to fight against the terrorist, terrorist attacks. And of course, there are some applications with cybersecurity optimizations. First, let us look at the scannable cybersecurity optimizations. We use a probability attacker graph to model security risk of our organization. It is a stackable game, actually. The defender select an optimal security portfolio to minimize the highest successful probability of all attacks, of, of attacks across all paths. Well, the attacker tries to find the most critical path with highest successful probability to reach the target. To help defender find an optimal security portfolio, we have several challenges. First, the optimization is by level because Defender tries to minimize security risk, but attacker tries to want to maximize that. It is also non-linear because security risk is in a multiplicative form that is non-linear. Also, when we try to implement a security portfolio, it is not cost-free. Also, sometimes it brings us some side effects. So when we try to minimize security risk, we also want to minimize side effects and spend as little as possible. Another challenge is efficiency and scalability. Because the number of paths that can be chosen by attacker will increase exponentially with respect to the, the size of organization. So we need an efficient and scalable solver to solve such a stubborn game. So the solution is that we convert the problem into and efficient mixed integer linear programming to help us find security portfolio. We also use a parallel front to find the most profitable uh, mixed uh, security portfolio that minimize security risk with reasonable side effect and uh, cost. An interesting reader, our audience can refer to ARMA and the Postquani paper in European Journal of Operational Research. Second, we also look at the time resilient in cybersecurity. We have a Markov chain that is used to investigate cybersecurity resilient to attacks. S0, S0 is a safe state in which we have no attack. And ST is a failure state in which attack has already reached his target. S1 to Sn is a state where a multi-step attack is ongoing. In this model, we are interested in the lifetime. Lifetime is the expected number of times that the attacker is in the system before it finally reaches the target. It is also a stackable game. But defender tries to maximize lifetime so the organization can survive from attacks as long as possible. But attacker tries to minimize that so he can reach the target in the shortest of time. To find the optimal security portfolio for, to maximize uh, resilience in the lifetime, we have two types, two types of analysis. The first one is expected time analysis. The security risk is, we consider security risk as the expected probability of success of all attacks. So we're looking at expectation of all possible paths for attacker. Another one is a worst case time analysis. We assume attack is optimal he always tried to find the most critical path with highest probability of all of success among all paths. Both, both analysis can be converted into a mixed integer linear programming using strong duality and the linearization techniques. <coughs> Sorry. We also look at the resilience in terms of duration of text. 
remember the last time is number of attacks the attacker needs to reach a target, but he, but each attacks may take different time to execute. So now here, the defender, where as a defender, tries to implement a security portfolio to ensure the longest the duration of time, the longest overall time, rather than number of attacks before attack is successful. A precise solution can also be found by the mixed integer linear programming. Finally, we also consider some Bayesian stack up game for cybersecurity. When attacks are ongoing, the defender may not directly observe attacker state, which means the defender, he doesn't know where the attack could be in the system, but he get an estimation through observations. Now, the defender needs to face multiple attack attacks, and each attack can attack from where attack is now. And the defender needs to select a corrective security portfolio to mitigate ongoing attacks. It is a um, bias and stack up again because, because of incomplete attack information. So far, existing bias and stack up solvers, all of them suffer from scalability problems. Say a company to attack a graph with 50 nodes, there is about 10 to 14 paths that can be chosen by the attacker. So actually no solver can handle such a large number of attack, graph, attack paths. The goal to solve such a problem is that we convert the problem into an efficient, again, mixed integer linear programming without sacrifice any optimality. Then we can solve that efficient. Well, thank you guys. This is our recent work on game theory for cybersecurity. Yeah. Thank you. Just thank you very much, Yung Shao. Thanks. Thank and you. Uh, uh, Okay, so let's uh, uh, very nice talk and uh, suggest uh, to move now to the next speaker, who is um, Andrew. Andrew? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, please can give your talk now. Uh, all right. Can you guys see okay? Oh, uh, no. Can you guys see this? No. Still not. Not yet, no. no. Hmm. How about now? No. Are you sharing your screen? I am. Here. Uh... This could be a, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, share screen, About now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, Okay, so uh, thank you. I'm going to go through this. Uh, I have more slides than I need, but the ideas are very simple. I'm just gonna get through this sort of as quickly as I can. So Wesley spoke a couple of weeks back about the work Paolo and uh, Edmund and I did uh, intuitionistic Vukashevitz logic or GBL, EWF. And uh, this is a fuzzy logic. And which means that you have values that can, uh, you know, in, in this unit interval of some kind, endowed with some, endowed with some appropriate algebra. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today is the idea that um, you can give GBL, EWF, a Kripke semantics. And uh, this we've been able to extend to other logics sort of in the neighborhood, um, which I'm not going to say really much about. Um, but this has been sort of the work I've been doing for my PhD, and um, it's, we can talk about those later if you'd like. So anyway, the idea is that 
uh, we're talking about things beneath uh, classical logic. If you're looking at, um, I have BL there as Boolean logic. What I mean is classical logic. And we're looking at this, if you look at this network here, this uh, GBL EWF is in the center and it's beneath v classical Vukashevitz logic and minimal, uh, above minimal Vukashevitz logic and it extends uh, affine logic as well. And uh, this GBL EWF, you can give it a natural deduction presentation, it looks like this. Um, the scary thing that should stand out to you is this rule of divisibility. And what that says is basically you can split things up or, and then reassemble them. Uh, it's a purely algebraic condition. And as you can see, it's non-analytic. There are subformulas that appear in the, uh, in the um, I guess in the, the premise of the rule that don't recur in the conclusion the rule. And so that has been resistant to proof theoretic analysis. Now this GBL EWF resembles intuitionistic logic. In fact, it is intuitionistic logic with a tensor and divisibility, right? And uh, with the, uh, without contraction. So I'm going to review quickly the semantics for intuitionistic logic, the Kripke semantics. And the idea is simple, right? It's just, you can think of it as um, sort of a mathematician increasing, you know, uh, going through time, increasing his knowledge. And uh, with, you know, he has more lemmas, you know, he can use and, you know, as things grow, sort of knowledge grows with time. Um, and it's, uh, anyway, the structure is intended to sort of, uh, reflect that intuition, I guess. And so briefly, the Kripke frame is just, you have a set of worlds and you have some pre-ordering or partial ordering on them. And you kind of define truth of the formulas uh, relative to individual points, right? And so this is the uh, individual nodes along the structure. And the key thing here that really stands out that is non-classical is the condition of implication. And that's when you, you say here that you force an implication at a node when everywhere in the future, right, each of the, you can, uh, everywhere in the future when you look ahead, um, those future nodes that, that force uh, the antecedent also force the consequent. And also bottom is never forced. And so the key property there as I said, is that your knowledge grows with time. And so it's this monotonicity property that is the key feature of these Kripke structures. And you can sort of illustrate this. You can see this, this is the counterexample for um, excluded middle in intuitionistic logic. So you have in this structure, right? Basically you only label typically uh, anyway, the formulas which you're forcing. So not P is forced along one branch or along in, at one node, but P is not forced at the other. And if this were a classical setting, P would have to be, P or not P would have to be forced everywhere. And so that gives the counter example. The little proof below shows that the double negation of this, of course, is provable. And this is just basically the idea behind uh, Glavenko's negative translations and such. Now, in the classical semantics then, truth grows in sort of a step. You think of it as a step function, right? Everything is, when you evaluate the formulas, they're either bottom or top. And you go up, the, when you proceed up the tree, as I said, things grow. So you proceed from bottom to top. It can be bottom, say, top, top, top forever, like on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. But what we're doing with GBL EWF, since it's a fuzzy logic, we somehow want to respect the fact that things can take intermediate values. And so for our semantics that we've based on this algebraic construction of Bofa and Montana, what happens is truth grows in a slope. 
so that you start at bottom and then you eventually arrive at top. Uh, you can also, of course, it's, it's permissible that, you know, the classical intuitionistic, you know, case holds. But the idea is that once you hit an intermediate value, you're top the rest of the way. And so we call these sloping functions in distinction with the classical case of step functions. And that's really the, the gist of the idea. The rest of this is, is uh, technicalities, um, just to, in case people are curious. But yeah, you have a partial order, and then you say, you know, if you have the, you know, this functions that goes from worlds to this MV algebra or the MV chain, and it's sloping if whenever you're above top, everywhere in the future, you hit top according to this evaluation scheme. And the, we call these Bova Montana structures and they do, they're just, they just consist of um, the worlds with this forcing relation and the post set, W is this post set. Uh, and the operations compose as you'd expect in the worlds. And some trickery is needed to get the implication condition to generalize correctly. Um, but actually, if you can, if you can see, uh, I don't know if you guys um, can see this well, but the idea is that basically this reflects a box. So just like in the classical Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic, that implication, the operation you can think of um, as sort of a box. Um, which is why we get the connection classically with S4, the modal logic S4 between intuitionistic logic and S4. Um, it's the same thing here. So this, this floor in FEMA, right, um, turns out that is a box operation. And this, um, and yeah, so this gives the condition, the right condition for implication. Um, and that's basically really all I wanted to say. The open problems for this um, are obviously kind of extending these insights to the rest of these constructive fuzzy logics in the neighborhood. Um, one particular thing to do, which I'm trying to work out now is to work out the modal connection to find out exactly what the target logic of uh, um, analogous to S4 is for the fuzzy case. And uh, maybe to try and use this to get some insights for other fuzzy logics in the neighborhood. Hey, thanks. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's nice talk. And uh, well, uh, we are actually running a bit out of time. So without further ado, maybe- I can... I do this, should I do this live? Okay. It's live and fast to open the video. Okay, please go ahead then, yeah. So Edmund, yeah, please. So let me just... Oops, sorry. So the essential part of live and faster than the video is being able to... Um, is being able to to hit the share screen buttons rapidly enough. Mm -hmm. um, can I just check with you that you can now see the, that slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Fantastic. So what I want to do is I want to talk about um, some fairly simple mathematics um, with some much more complicated mathematics in the background that I'm, I'm that I'm not going to talk to you about. So I'm going to talk to you about um, some technology called logical relations and relate it to the equivalence of processes. And as Pasquale mentioned, this builds the mentioned work that we talked about. This, this is, forms part of one of our, our program grant um, work. So specifically the program grant is IRIS Interface Reasoning for Interacting Systems. And it builds on the separation work, logic work that we did here at Queen Mary. As you mentioned, that now has led into industry leading program analysis and verification being carried on at Facebook, but also using similar technologies at Amazon. 
and the idea of iris is to apply that to a much wider range of um, a much wider range of systems. Partners in this are Facebook, Amazon Web Services, BT, GridPP, a num num number of other companies. And we have some fairly distinguished academic partners as well. So logical relations is quite a simple idea. You suppose you've got um, two or more views of the same system. So those might be different subsets of the same system. You're looking at uh, different areas of it. Um, or it might be different visibility levels. In one view, you can see some stuff which is hidden in the other. Or it might be different abstraction levels of, of the same system. So, for example, you've got a one view as a, spe a specification and an implementation. So one view would be program code and the other view might be machine code. Um, but in any case, when you want to look at those different views, they're going to be encapsulated in two different models. Of, of the system, but inevitably those models are going to be related. Um, so here's a picture where we have two different models of the same, um, the same system and we've got three different parts of, of the system. And the colour coded uh, dots are, are supposed to be related so that the pink dots correspond, pink dot in model one corresponds to the pink dot in model two and the blue dot corresponds uh, in model two corresponds to the blue dot in model one etc. And the basic idea of logical relations is very simple it's that if you've got an operation in your system an operator um, then when you apply it to related inputs you should get related results. So because we're applying um, this operation to related inputs at the top, we should get related results at the bottom. They should represent essentially the same, the same thing in the system. Okay, now what gives this legs is that our models are built by applying mathematical constructions to basic starting points and our relations are built by applying similar constructions to starting relations. Let me check. And that you can see if we go to the simplest possible model of a process, as a basic, this is kind of a non deterministic state transition system. So here we have really only have one, one set, a set of possible system states. Um, we have another set, a set of actions, and given the action and the system state, our one operation tells us what, what the possible set of results, result states might be. Now, if we're trying to relate these together, um, we want a relation between the set of states, and we want to say that given an action and, a pair, and two set states that are related, we get a related set of possible outcome states. And when we feed this through our technology, what we rediscover is we, we rediscover the standard notion of process equivalence, which is Bart Milner by simulation. I'm not going to go into that. If that was just one point, this would be interesting, but not, um, not striking. Uh, but when we move on to more complex notions such as systems with internal computation. Um, doesn't work quite as we expected. Um, but if we use a derived structure to give our target model, so I'm going to have to scoot through this very quickly. So the problem here is that um, the typical model gives you, um, has an internal computation as a quiet action. Um, and if we simply take that, we don't get an interesting notion. But if we allow, for example, arbitrary sequences of quiet actions intermingled with visible ones, um, then we get the notion of weak by simulation. And if we allow a sequence of quiet actions to give a synchronization point followed by a visible one, then we get another standard form of by simulation called branching by simulation. We can go further. Um, we can move on to probabilistic systems and here instead of 
just having a function between um, for a non-deterministic function, a function modeled as a function from states to a set of possible outcome states. We have a probabilistic function, which is modeled as a Markov kernel. Then um, here again, we get standard, standard notions of equivalence. So basically by using this, this very simple kind of mathematical technique, um, what we're able to extract is notions, is standard notions of equivalence between process systems. And we can then build on that to incorporate those into logics for reasoning about these systems. But that's another story. Thank you.